of condition and oh, got it. And integrate forward in time in the GCM. Um, we fix the zonal mean state to be the time mean state from the full GCM simulation for a given climate. And then we um, periodically rescale the eddies so they remain at small amplitude. And this is to remove the nonlinearity associated with advection. Um, but we, we do include moisture, so it's not a, a linear problem. We have we assume that the ascending error is saturated. That's the simplest approximation you can make. Uh, the descending error, there's no latent heat release in that, just in the ascending error, like you see in the cartoon at the bottom. And so you're making a, a mistake there in the sense that normally air has to rise some distance before it becomes saturated. Uh, but in the big picture, this approximation actually works pretty well. And then um, we integrate forward and the fastest growing normal mode will emerge over time. So that's the basic idea. And then we can do this for different climates by taking different time mean states as our, as our basic state. So what does this look like? Well, we'll start with a, a very cold climate. And on the, I'm going to show the vertical velocity just to illustrate these because it, it's quite sensitive to moisture. Um, so this is the most unstable that emerges in very cold climate. And you see you have on the left a periodic wave in mid latitudes. Red is up and blue is down. You can see the red and blue are a little bit different um, in size, but basically it's pretty symmetric uh, in this very cold climate because there isn't that much water vapor, uh, which would break the symmetry. And the right is just a cross section of the vertical velocity um, at a particular latitude, and you can see this, this kind of wave number six pattern. So now we'll go to um, present day climate type temperatures. And now you do see some differences between up and down. The up areas are much narrower and they're stronger. So overall mass must be conserved. So much air is going up is down, but uh, the we have a narrowing of the upward moving air. Um, and so this is, you know, the in, in terms of the most unstable mode, this is equivalent to what we see in, in present day climate. And you can go a lot further uh, in various ways, including more nonlinearity and so forth. But this is similar to a present day climate. And now if we keep warming it up, uh, at first we just see the narrower region getting narrower and so on uh, to some extent. But there isn't much change for a while. And then eventually, if you get to a hot climate, uh, and even before that, you, you see a dramatic change. The fastest growing mode switches to a vortex mode. And you hopefully can see it right in the middle of the panel here, the strong ascent surrounded by descent. It's a bit easier to see in the cross section. You see the spike. Um, and when we first saw this, we weren't quite sure what it was. And maybe it's wave number one or something like that. But really, it's actually just an isolated uh, vortex. And it turns out that something that's been seen in models before it's seen in observations, it's called a diabatic uh, Rusby vortex. So that becomes the fastest growing mode in a, a warm enough and moist enough climate. So this is a fundamentally different type of instability. It's just, it's not like just the dry instability with some slight modification from latent heating. Latent heating is key to this type of instability. Um, basically, the latent heating replaces meridional advection of potential vorticity. We'll talk about what that means later. And the transition happens in terms of this GCM at a global mean surface temperature of about 300 Kelvin. But if you look at summer temperatures, um, that, that, sorry, I should say in terms of global mean temperature, that's very far away from where we are now. But if you look at seasonal temperatures and look in the say the Northern hemisphere, it's not so far away from where we are now. It's not easy to make a direct comparison with this more idealized GCM. So I should say we're seeing this becoming fast growing mode. It doesn't mean it has to completely dominate uh, the solution. That's not what we see when we run the idealized GCM in warm climates, but it does mean that we should expect it to be uh, a much mo uh, a more important feature of the extropical weather systems. So I mentioned this is seen in observations. I want to show you what that looks like. So this is a climatology from Butcher and Vernley um, from a number of years ago, uh, showing on the left, the Atlantic Basin, and on the right, the Pacific Basin. And then the shading is showing the number of these um, diabetic Rosby vortices that they identified with a special tracking algorithm. Um, and then the points are where the genesis is uh, in different seasons. Uh, depending whether it's black or open uh, circles. 
So I, I should mention, you'll see in the caption, they, there's an alternative terminology. These are sometimes called diabetic Rosby wave. Um, and so I'll use those interchangeably. Uh, diabetic Rosby waves make sense as, as a name in that these propagate quite fast and latent heating is replacing dry advection as the mechanism of the propagation. So that's why it makes sense, Rodby wave versus Rod, Rodby vortex. We really see these isolated structures, uh, so it makes sense to us to call it a, a vortex, but bo both could make sense. Um, and the famous example um, uh, highlighted in a paper by Heine Vernley is the winter storm Lothar that went across the Atlantic, uh, interacted with the jet stream and a lot of impacts in Europe. Uh, but there's also been high impact events involving diabetic Rosby vortices on the east coast of the US, for example. So let's, uh, this is a video that Matthew made uh, showing some development of uh, diabetic Rosby vortices. Uh, two of them that start off near Florida, one of them goes north um, along off the coast of the US and the other one goes across the Atlantic. And they later maybe developed into more complex storms, but at, at, at some point according to the you know, in the main um, progression of these storms, according to the climatology from Butcher and Wernley, it is in fact, these are diabetic Rosby vortices. So hopefully this uh, video will work over Zoom. So you, you can start things starting in this region um, and moving across the Atlantic like so. So that's the first one. Uh, but you can also see a second one that went here. Um, so I think in Matthew's video, it will now actually start reversing. So you can kind of follow back uh, to see where it, where it came from, these two storms. And then it'll go forward and you may want to look at this other storm that goes up here. So they can go quite quickly, is only propagate and also go uh, more pullward, they're relatively small, they involve a lot of moist dynamics, so they're going to be more difficult to predict um, from a numerical weather prediction uh, point of view. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, I wanted to do address two questions about the diabetic Rosby vortex. Um, and you can think about it as an extra tropical storm with purely moist dynamics in this you know, kind of a certain limit. Um, so what is the structure of this diabetic Rosby vortex mode we found in the hot climate? How is it maintained by latent heating? And then, uh, you know, our main point here is we have a new theory for the diabetic Rosby vortex that predicts its growth rate and length scale as a function of the climate state, which, by which I mean the temperature profile and the humidity. So I'll start with what, what kind of, what is the structure of this uh, type of storm? And I'll just give a brief refresher on potential vorticity because I'll be using that a lot. And I know Sam Steckman talked about an earlier talk in this uh, series. He was introducing moist uh, potential vorticity or PV. Here we'll rely on the dry PV, but look at its sources and sinks from moisture. So potential vorticity or PV, we say is a combined measure of the spin of the parcel of air and stratification, and it's conserved for adiabatic frictionless flow. So it involves the absolute vorticity and the gradient of theta, which mostly matters in the vertical. So the vertical gradient of theta is the largest part of that. Um, so that's the first part. And then the second question is, well, how does latent heating affect potential vorticity? And the formula for it is given here. You can see it's proportional to the absolute vorticity, but it also involves a vertical gradient of theta dot. Uh, this is approximate, but this is kind of the dominant term. So if we have some latent heating represented by this cloud here, we'll tend to generate negative PV uh, higher up above the maximum of the heating and positive PV down below. So this is a really key factor for considering how latent heating affects um, extratropical storms or affects storms in general. So we can then go to our normal mode that's a diabetic Rosby vortex in the hot climate. And what's shown here in shading is the potential vorticity versus longitude and pressure. Uh, and what you see, the basic features is there's a very large anticyclonic or negative PV uh, in the upper, middle and upper troposphere. And then there's cyclonic PV in the lower troposphere. And then there's stuff going on the boundary layer, which may not be very realistic. So I won't talk about as much about that. 
Um, so that's the PV we see in the growing mode. And then we can also look at what latent heating is doing to generate PV, and that's shown in the contours. Um, I should say the values here are all very small because this is coming from the small amplitude mode. We'll see some finite amplitude storms later. What you can see is, uh, as I promised, you know, the, if, in neglecting the boundary layer for simplicity, you see low levels, you get positive PV generation, upper levels, negative PV generation. Um, and in general, the blue is overlying the blue and the red is overlying the red. So this is going to cause the storm to grow. So that's how the storm is, is growing. Uh, but you can also notice, um, oh yeah, that's the same point I just made, but you can also notice there's a phase shift. So the contours, the PV generation are a little bit offset from the maximum, say, in the PV itself. And the same in the red uh, case, the positive PV is a little bit to the west where the generation is. And this is the uh, classic picture of counter-propagating Rosby waves now in a moist context. Uh, we have westerly wind here, which all else being equal would just shear apart the whole structure. But this is a normal mode that's keeping its structure. And so what's happening is the generation is a little bit to the west. So that uh, tends to combat the westerly wind to some extent. Similarly here, the generation is a bit to the east. And so the whole structure will propagate um, to the east, but it can keep its same structure um, due to these uh, slight offsets. So this fits in very nicely into our understanding of how normal modes grow in bioclinic instability in general, just with this twist that it's all being happening through the latent heating. And we don't have a wave-like structure, we just have this isolated structure. Um, so I mentioned that you do also see these kind of storms when you run, when you don't just calculate a small amplitude mode, but actually uh, run the GCM into a statistical equilibrium. So I just wanted to, the, the storms aren't everywhere, but they do occur. So on the left, we have the small amplitude mode I was just talking about. And on the right, we have the storm in the simulation. Um, and you can see, so this is just one storm we picked out. Now the, you know, these PV values are very low over here in PV units, but over here they're quite strong. And so you can see some similarities. Uh, we have the red uh, positive PV down here. Uh, we have the blue positive PV up here, uh, but there are also some differences. And the biggest one is that the, the blue negative PV, the anticyclonic PV, is much uh, smaller in extent than what you see in the small amplitude mode. So, uh, sorry, the generation is uh, much smaller in extent, plus the PV itself. So what's going on here? Well, here's something I, I probably should have mentioned earlier, but um, we in writing down the potential vorticity generation rate, one term is the term I focused on earlier, this kind of dipole term, that's proportional to theta, theta dot dz, but it also makes sense to um, include the upper upward advection. So there's strong upward motion going on in the storm generating the latent heating. It, it, it makes sense, I think, and uh, this follows from uh, a classic paper by Hoskins, 1985, that you include this upward advection that's directly related to the latent heating. Uh, when you do that, that's what that's what causing, and that, that effect is much more important um, for the finite amplitude storm because um, the anomalies are very large. So you're creating this strong positive PV anomaly down here. And that PV anomaly gets advected up as the storm develops and tends to decrease or wipe out the negative PV here, although it can't get rid of all of it. And that'll be important when we look at observations um, shortly. Um, and this is something that's been seen before, for example, in, in tropical cyclones that matters or in um, other, other extropical storms, but it's clearly playing a large role here. Okay, and lastly, what about the storms we do see in the current climate, um, the observed diabolic Rosby vortices, vortices, sorry, I've got picked two examples. One on the left is a winter storm, and on the right is a summer storm. So if we look at the summer storm first, um, you can see it's pretty similar to what we saw in the hot climate. This, I should say, is from ERA-5 reanalysis, I believe. Um, it's pretty similar, although things don't extend as high up in the atmosphere. And that's just because water vapor is not extending as high up in the atmosphere because our climate isn't as warm as the hot climates I was showing you earlier. But you see the blue anomaly. It's not quite as clear, I would say, as in the the mode or the GCM simulation, but generally the structure is pretty similar. 
However, if you look at the winter storm, now you really just see what you might call a red blob at the bottom. It's very surface confined. There really isn't much evidence of a negative PV uh, feature here. And so this is a little perplexing as, you know, if it's growing, we would expect there to be a negative PV. However, um, you know, as I mentioned, upward advection matters. Uh, so uh, that has to be taken into account of the anomalies of PV. Also the PV generation is, rate itself is dependent on the absolute vorticity, which will be much larger in the in the red part of this diagram. So there's reasons to believe it, uh, that this is accurate, although you know, one has these are reasonably small features, strongly diabetic in a reanalysis. So this is not directly observations. But we do speculate in our paper on this in, in jazz that this may explain why some of these uh, DRVs that you see in observations or reanalysis tend to propagate more than they're growing. They are maintaining their you know, their strength against friction, but they're, they're, and they're growing, but not as much as you might expect. And they are propagating very strongly. And that's what you'd expect if you have this kind of structure here. Okay, so that's uh, some phenomenology of this uh, diabetic Rosby vortex and how it's maintaining itself. And so we want to talk now about a, a theory for this diabetic Rosby vortex that predicts its growth rate and length scale as a function of the climate state. And so what we do here is we work with the quasi-geostrophic two-layer model, which is, a, again, another classic model for baryothenic instability. Um, and it will produce unstable baryothenic waves growing that grow in the presence of shear. So basically, we have two layers of the atmosphere so you can view this as literally two layers say of constant entropy or perhaps just as a very coarse discretization in the vertical um, there's an upper flat boundary and a lower flat boundary and then there's interface between the two layers which will denote its height eta uh, because there is an interface that corresponds to a, a temperature gradient in the y direction just like we have on earth so if you could think of this as the lower potential temperature layer at the bottom and the upper layer is the higher potential temperature layer as you go north so right in this diagram you're going to colder uh, colder air uh, but because the thickness of the layer is changing that also means the potential vorticity is changing and so we get a PV gradient up here and a PV gradient of opposite sign uh, in the lower layer. And it is the advection against those gradients that really generates the instability in a dry uh, atmosphere. And so again, with this kind of model, you can, you can run it fully nonlinearly, I'll show that later, but you can also drop the nonlinear advective terms to study the small amplitude instability. And that's what we'll do for now. And what we want to do is add moisture to this and there's a few different ways you could do that. And I think we're going to do the simplest. Uh, what we're doing is probably the simplest way you could do it, which is to introduce a parameter or in the, or a, a function or in the thermodynamic equation. So this is an equation for potential temperature theta. On the, usually on the right, you would have latent heat release. But what we've done is we've replaced that by introducing this factor or, which is a function of W. Um, it reduces to a scalar or when we have upward motion. So or could be say 0.1. And then when we have downward motion, it's one. So the thermodynamic equation is just the usual thermodynamic equation. And so you can think of this as reducing the static stability in the sent regions. Um, and this was introduced in Manuel Fantini's fork, which is a classic paper on moist baryclinic instability. The parameter R over here, the scalar, uh, can be derived as a function of temperature and pressure. So we generally know what that is. Uh, what makes this challenging mathematically is we now effectively have a nonlinear heavy side function, a um, heavy side function which is nonlinear, and that means that or evolves with the flow, right? You have to know where you have ascent and descent. Uh, what was shown in the paper by Manuel Fantini and Thorpe is that in this kind of two layer model, they actually did a semi geostrophic model, but it's pretty similar in this quasi geostrophic case. You get a, a periodic wave that's unstable. Um, it has a faster growth rate than the dry model and a smaller ascent region than the dry model. Uh, so these were, you know, you're basically getting a similar kind of wave, but it's been modified by latent heating. So we'd like to use the two layer model, uh, including latent heating, but get uh, the regime where we get these diabetic Rosby vortices. And that is a little bit tricky in a two layer model because you only have the two layers. But what we saw earlier is that the diabetically generated um, 
potential vorticity anomalies, that is the ones from latent heating, they're occurring in the interior of the atmosphere. So really what we need is a model for the interior of the atmosphere and something that's less focused on the boundaries. And it's hard to separate those two uh, issues, two aspects in a two-layer model. Um, oh, sorry, I had one more slide I wanted to show you. I just wanted to show you how this parameter or varies um, over the seasonal cycle in the current climate. This is from reanalysis. And what you can see is that or it has to be between zero and one. If we look at the Northern hemisphere, it's maybe 0.45 in winter, and it gets down to about 0.1 in summer. Southern hemisphere is a smaller seasonal cycle, but again, or is lower in winter. So that means, uh, sorry, it's lower in summer. So in general, summer is hotter, more, uh, more water vapor, uh, more latent heating. So we expect or to be lower, and that makes sense. If you go to a very warm climate in mid latitudes, you actually approach the limit of a moist adiabatic stratification, which is the or tends to zero limit. So the or tends to zero limit is quite interesting, both for summer in the current climate and also um, for thinking about climate change to a warmer climate. Okay, so how do we make this a model for diabetic Busby vortices? Well, what we do is we take the simple approach of tilting the boundaries. Um, so now it's the same kind of model. It has a tilt in the interface, which corresponds to a tilt or a temperature gradient, sorry. But now we have the exact same tilt in the upper boundary and in the lower boundary. And having done this and worked on it for a while, we actually discovered in retrospect that uh, Francis Bredderton had suggested this idea as a way to separate out the issue of what are the PV gradients and what is the temperature gradient. You want to be able to control them. And what we want to control them in the sense that we want to look at the simplest case where the PV gradient is actually zero. So notice the thickness of the layers in the basic state are not, is now constant. So there's no PV gradient in the upper or lower layer. And here's the shear, uh, the westerly winds um, that correspond to the basic state. So when we do this, we find that the unstable modes are now diabetic Rossby vortices and we can study them. Uh, I should say we've also done the case where you have a, a tilt in the boundaries, but not quite this much. And then you get interesting transitions between the diabetic Rossby vortices and uh, the more conventional wave-like instability, but I don't have time to get into that. But you could read more about that in our, our jazz paper. So, here is the vertical, here's an example when we time match forward the tilted two layer model for R equals 0 0.01. So that's very strong latent heating. Uh, we don't have not a vection of wave wave interaction. So a vection of the wave by itself or, or the vortex by itself in this. Um, and you just see as it goes forward, you'll see we start from some noisy condition. We see the emergence of these vortices. Um, there's three of them currently, and if you keep going, you actually end up with just one vortex. This is the vertical velocity, so positive means a very strong upward motion. So this is very like what we saw in the general circulation model instability problem, but it's much, much simpler. We're now down to this two-layer model, which essentially becomes almost a 1D model in terms of equations. So what does its potential vorticity anomalies and structure look like. So here's on the left is the vertical velocity, and then we're just going to focus in on the region where the vortex occurs. That's shown on the right here. So from X equals five to nine. So just right in this region, you see you have a positive PV in the lower layer, negative P in the upper layer, PV in the upper layer, and you see the diabetic generation is phase shifted just as we had in the GCM. Uh, because it's a two-layer model, it's QG. The upper there's a certain symmetry between the upper and lower layers. You can flip the sign and get it. Uh, but apart from that, this seems like a pretty good model for the diabetic Busby vortex. So just the mechanism of growth is very similar to what we saw earlier. We've got latent heating where there's upward motion, negative PV generation above, positive PV below, which generates positive PV. Uh, there's an offset. Um, uh, that allows it to stay in the same place uh, despite the, the shear. So with this kind of wind profile, uh, the westerly winds, um, we won't actually get eastward propagation, but you could easily add on a positive view at, at both levels, and then you would get, again, the kind of realistic situation where the storms move to the east. So can we make progress analytically? Uh, the answer is yes. So you can combine the equations of the two-layer model to just get an equation for W. 
that's a good thing to do because W is where the nonlinearity is um, in the small amplitude limit because of latent heating. So you want to focus on that variable. So it involves four derivatives, for example. Um, sigma is the growth rate. We also have a term here that matters, which you can view as a radiative cooling. It's bouncing in the average the uh, latent heating that emerges in this diabetic Rosby vortex model, but didn't appear actually in the Emmanuel Fantini torp type model uh, for a moist wave, which is interesting, um, but we do need it here. And the main challenge in solving this is that these ores here depend on W, right? So this is very nonlinear. So we solve in the following way. Here's a sketch. Uh, here's W as a function of X, which you can think of as longitude. We have an ascent region where R is less than one. We have a boundary at X equals B between the ascent region and the descent region. And then in the descent region out here, we have R equals one. And then, you know, you can think of this as being, uh, having symmetry about uh, the X equals zero line. So we only need to solve one side of this uh, vortex. And so at the boundary, you have to be careful to en enforce uh, the right uh, matching conditions uh, between the ascent and descent regions. Basically, we require a continuity of, of certain uh, derivatives. And the other tricky thing about this uh, technically is that we want to solve in the limit of a large domain. So it's an isolated vortex, but we take the limit of the domain size going to infinity. And it turned out to be very important to do that. Uh, in just the right way to take that limit so that you get a correct mass continuity or mass conservation. So we can then um, derive a dispersion relation relating the growth rate and the length scale to R. Uh, that's what's shown here. Uh, the Ks are kind of like wave numbers. We're not assuming any kind of sinusoidal um, or exponential um, uh, structure, but yeah, that's you get these case uh, which you can think of, of as being like wave numbers that appear. Um, so this can be solved easily numerically um, to find the growth rate in the length scale. Um, this closed form can be solved to find the, the growth rate in the length scale. But the um, to get actual explicit analytical expressions, you can look at the kind of interesting limit of R tends to zero, right? So you can think of that as the warm climate limit or a very hot summer limit. And so that's when latent heating really matters a lot. So here are the results for that. Um, so as R tends to zero, uh, on the left, we have the growth rate of a dry wave, no moisture at all. In the middle, a moist periodic wave where we do have PV gradients in the model. So it's not really the interior of the atmosphere. And that's what Emmanuel Fantini and Thorpe found. And then, and um, and Pablo Zarita Gilder also had a very nice paper on this. And then on the right, you have the diabetic Rosby vortex. Uh, the top row is the growth rate non dimensionally, and the bottom is in using a deformation radius and the shear, a reasonable shear to give dimensional values. So for a dry wave, it's 0.5 per day. Moist wave, it's larger, 1.28 times per day. And then a DRV, diabetic Rosby vortex, is nearly two per day. So it's much faster. So basically, thinking the way to think about it is going from the dry to a moist wave uh, in this very moist limit, you get 2.5 times the growth rate. And then if you go to a diabetic Rosby vortex, you get another 1.5. So the DRV relative to the dry wave is 3.75 uh, times faster in its growth. So we think this is this overall picture is consistent with the emergence of the DRV as the fastest growing mode in the warm limit of the GCM because that is the the structure baroclinic structure that grows the fastest in that limit. You can also look at the length scale and what we find here and here it's going to be the length scale of the ascent region. Um, this is the simplest thing to compare across the different types of disturbances. And what you see is basically in the limit of R tends to zero, very strong latent heating, the moist wave and the DRV have the same uh, length scale, uh, but they're much smaller than the dry wave. And as R tends to zero, the length scale actually goes to zero in this model. So we're just giving you a sent lens in kilometers for R, a particular very small value R, 0 0.01. So we think other things may come in to limit the length scale, but we get, um, Length scale is about 200 kilometers for the DRV in that limit. One interesting question is, do you always get diabetic Rosby vortex solutions? Well, according to this model, no. Um, 
if you look at the growth rate now solved numerically from the dispersion relation as a function of R, um, you can see it, it increases as R becomes smaller, stronger latent heating. But there's also this singular point here at point four where the solution breaks down. If you look at the length scale, it just um, goes towards infinity as you get to that point. And so basically, we, we if you look at the equations, you can see what's happening at R equals 0 0.38. Um, you get a you can get solutions for or below that value and for or values larger than that at least on an infinite domain uh, they don't exist anymore and so this is quite interesting um the you know the there is this kind of transition between wave-like and vortex-like solutions has been seen before for example there's a paper by Le Perrin and Feld who also saw it in a different type of two-layer model um, and so it's not clear how this threshold extends to the real world, for example, but it's certainly interesting. It's, it's there in the Tuller model that we've developed. I would like to just kind of step back from the analogical results and say, well, why intuitively would you expect to go from an isolated vortex, from a wave to an isolated vortex mode when you have strong latent heating? And so this is a, a thought experiment to think about that. Um, question. So let's say if we started at the top here with a wave train of positive and negative PV anomalies, like so. Um, say this is in the lower layer of our model. Well, those positive and negative PV anomalies will generate marginal flow, so north and south flow between them. Um, that will lead to, you can think of it as leading to upward motion and descent. Um, and where you have upward motion, you'll get latent heating. But we saw earlier that latent heating will generate positive PV anomalies in the lower layer, but not negative PV anomalies, at least in the simplest case. And so those positive um, PV anomalies will tend to get amplified, and the negative anomalies will be weakened by this process. They're not zero, but they'll be weakened. So if we idealize this as showing just all positive PV anomalies, that's what you might end up, at least in an unstable mode. Uh, at the bottom, we have the alternate case where we just have one positive PV anomaly. And the question is, which will grow faster? Well, the series of positive PV anomalies has the unfortunate characteristic that between them, the induced flow from each of them tends to cancel out in terms of marginal flow. Um, and if you think of marginal flow being related to upward motion just by an isentropic up glide type of uh, hypothesis, then you, this kind of situation is going to not lead to a strong upward motion as when you have just one vortex on its own. And so this argument suggests that an isolated anomaly is going to be the fastest growing mode of the system when latent heating is, is dominant. And it basically comes down to the fact that latent heating is generating um, PV of one sign in the lower layer and PV of only one sign in the upper layer. Whereas Marijonal advection, say in a dry wave, could generate uh, PV anomalies to both signs in a given layer. Okay, uh, lastly, I want to show some examples of when you run this tilted or untilted, actually give somewhat similar results um, uh, in a tilted two-layer model with strong latent heating. Uh, so on the left, I'm showing the vorticity, relative vorticity in the lower layer, a snapshot from a simulation. So we're not talking about unstable modes anymore, just running it forward with, with drag and, and radiative cooling and so on. Um, and what you see is you have waves and maybe vortices in this dry limit. But when we go to the strong latent heating regime, we actually get uh, what we might call a DRV world uh, in the same sense that people have, have dubbed uh, tropical cyclone simulations in an F-plane, a tropical cyclone world, this seems to be a DRV world. So we get these much smaller vortices. Um, let me try and show you a movie of how this works. So now this is all for R equals 0 0.01, so very strong latent heating. The vorticity is in the lower layer on the left, vertical velocity on the right. So you see the formation of these spikes in vertical velocity. They almost have these trails behind them. Um, you can see these um, stronger red anomalies here to the left, and generally small-scale vortices. We know these are diabatic Brosby vortices because we've made composites of them or, or looked at their structure in detail, and that's what, what they are. You'll notice that they're propagating northward. Um, let me just show you that again. 
عندك So especially in the vertical velocity field, it's easy to see they're going northward. And that's because the that's a nonlinear advection effect. You have a positive PV in the lower layer. It's offset from a negative PV in the upper layer. And they both induce velocities on each other that tends to push them north. Um, so that's what we would expect. And if we had a more realistic base stage winds, um, they would also go to the east. So the implication of these kind of simulations is that um, the DRV solution actually does become dominant in fully nonlinear simulations if you go to effectively a sufficiently warm climate. So we don't know, we know that that's not quite what happens in the GCM. Um, there might be more DRVs, but they are, they might be stronger, but they're not dominating the flow. And so we think this is probably a difference between um, QG equations and primitive equations, depends on the Rosby number. And so there's a very interesting question which Matthew and I are looking into as to how, as you vary Rosby number, which which type of um, solution is is the one that emerges. Okay, so to conclude, uh, we've talked about these diabatic Rosby vortices in the present and hot climates. The effect of increasing water vapor in extratropical dynamics is really interesting one that's interested me for a long time. Uh, one aspect is the most unstable mode um, switches to a, a vortex in sufficiently hot and moist climates. So I think that's really fascinating. These vortices, diabatic Rosby vortex, represent the limit of purely moist dynamics, um, and they can be high impact storms in current climate. I think it's also useful to just to study these type of storms as a, you know, the kind of a limiting case, but I think we may, by studying them, learn better to deal with moist dynamics and that will help us for other storms that are affected by moisture, but are not quite as extreme in terms of their dynamics as DRVs. Our tilted two layer model gives us some analytical results for the growth rate and length scale of diabetic growth before C. So these were not available before. And what the main thing we find is that these DRVs grow faster than both the dry and moist waves when they occur. Uh, but they only occur for strong enough latent heating in the two layer model, which is interesting. Um, and so this preference for vortices over waves with strong latent heating, we think results from single signed PV generation from latent heating in each layer, um, as we illustrated over here. I think there's a lot of open questions in future work. Um, so these DRVs in our current climate only, you know, preferentially occur in certain seasons. Um, they have uh, hemispheric differences, um, seasonal differences, and we've got this growth rate. So there's you know, been a lot of work in the past about trying to explain the distribution of, of storms, where storms grow, how fast they grow, using simple theory like the ED growth rate. So can we use this kind of theory to predict um, seasonality, geographic variation, climate change variation of um, diabetic Rusby vortices? And one interesting question is, is there a link to polar lows? Um, some polar lows look like um, moist spiraling instability, not all. And so that that could be an interesting thing to look at also. I mean, I think a big question is, does the frequency or strength of diabetic Rosby vortices increase as the climate warms in simulations and observed trends? Uh, we're looking into that uh, on the simulation side. Um, it also would be interesting to look at it in observations. Uh, so, you know, for simulations, looking at more realistic simulations in summer, for example. And then I think theoretically, we still need to build up our understanding from two layer QG theory, which we've got a, a theory for two primitive equations, maybe semi geostrophy in between as well could be interesting, and two observations. So we, we have some understanding, but we need to uh, expand over a kind of over a hierarchy of models and observations. Okay, so thank you very much. I will finish there. Sorry, I can't quite hear you. I don't know if it's just me.